And today we're going to continue on the topic of the kingdom of God. And tonight we're going to uh, touch base a little bit on the privileges of being part of the kingdom of God. All right. So we've already established um, what the kingdom of God is. And then we also looked at um, the purpose that God wants to accomplish by establishing the kingdom. We're going to look at the um, amazing privileges that come with being part of the kingdom of God. India is the largest democracy in the world today, and we have a growing and thriving population of over 1.3 billion people. And we continue to grow. But what you might find interesting is, it's not an easy thing to become a citizen of India. Of course, if you're born in India, and your parents are Indians, then you are automatically granted the privilege, uh, the pride of being called an Indian. But if you are not born in India, and you do not have uh, parents of Indian heritage, then it's not so easy to become a citizen of this great and mighty nation. India does not encourage uh, what we call as dual citizenship. You know, meaning you cannot hold uh, an American passport and an Indian passport. You know, to be able to get an Indian passport, you have to give up your American citizenship. In other words, you have to renounce your citizenship of whatever country you belong to to be able to become a citizen of India. You cannot hold on to the identity of another country and then still want to have the identity of this country as well. And I would say this is very much parallel to what we see in the Bible pertaining to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, the way it operates, the kingdom of God also does not offer dual citizenship. Yes? When you make the commitments or when you choose to receive the kingdom of God, you have a choice that you make. The choice is, I'm going to give up everything of this world. I'm going to give up all the desires and everything that everyone else pursues in this earth. I'm going to give that up because what I have found is of greater value and of greater privilege to be in the part of the kingdom of God. And yet a lot of people, they approach the kingdom of God with this attitude of, I want this and I want that. And Lord, how can I make a deal with you? You know, in what way can I hold on to what I have and still receive what it is that you're giving me? And if you read any of the amazing parables that Jesus teaches pertaining to the kingdom of God, every single parable that Jesus taught was about men and women who would give up everything when they found the value of the kingdom of God. Like the man who found the pearl, and when he found the pearl, he went back, and the Bible says he sold everything that he owned so that he would then buy this priceless pearl. And again and again, Jesus made this parallel, something about if you choose to come into the kingdom of God, then there has to be a choice that you make, and this choice is, I'm going to give up everything else to become part of this kingdom. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, he says, You cannot serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Meaning, you cannot serve the world and also God. There has to be a choice, a distinction that has to be made. James 4.4, 4, the Bible says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is Enmity with God. How strong words. The Bible is saying, if you're going to be a friend of the world, you're going to be an enemy of God. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's what the Bible says. Meaning the moment you say yes to the kingdom of God, the moment you say yes to Jesus Christ, you are in effect surrendering 
your passport. You're surrendering your right for this world. You're surrendering your right for the desires of this world. You're surrendering the right to want to do the things that everyone else does. And you're saying, I found something better. I found something bigger. I found something more meaningful. And because I found something bigger, better, and more meaningful, all of this I counted lost. That's what Paul said. In comparison to the glorious riches that is found in Jesus Christ, everything else in my life has no value. It's meaningless. That's the true way of discovering the kingdom of God. There are several scriptures in the Bible that remind us of who we are and what we need to focus as God's children. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, the Bible says, for our citizenship is in heaven. From, for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body so that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he's able even to subdue all things to himself. Meaning, Paul is reminding us, you no longer hold the right to this earth. You hold a citizenship in heaven. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. The Bible says, dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners. Yeah, temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. It says, keep away from all these things. There are many people in our nation who aspired to leave India uh, to go work abroad and eventually settle down in a new country and become an American, an Australian, and a European, or to hold a citizenship of another country. And for a lot of us, sometimes we have been ingrained as we grow up in our country, you know, leave India, you know, find another place. Because we're kind of taught that the privileges of holding a European passport or an American passport or, or a Canadian passport has greater value than holding an Indian passport. I won't say much more about that. I'm just going to leave that there. Um, talking about the kingdom, the privileges that come with being a citizen of the kingdom. The incredible things that God bestows upon his children are incomparable, indescribable, immeasurable compared to any privilege you might ever get from any country on this face of the earth. You know, there's no better country on this earth that could ever even offer you a shadow of what the kingdom of God offers to anyone who inherits it into their life. And that's what I want to tell you tonight. You know, more than aspiring for all these great citizenships that you think that are, give you greater value and greater identity of who you are, I tell you, aspire to become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Because when you become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, there's nothing greater. There's nothing more beautiful. There's nothing more precious. Because the kingdom of heaven, the Bible says, has has no end. Every other kingdom on this earth ends. Every other country will disappear one day, but the kingdom of God never ends. There is no, no demise of the kingdom of God. It stands eternal. That's what the kingdom of God is. We can speak in great detail about the true freedom that God offers the children who are part of the kingdom, the joy unspeakable that he grants us, a world with no pain, sickness, and sorrow that is to come. But with the short time that I have tonight that, is made, that has been made even shorter thanks to my dad, um, I want to place before you a few of the amazing privileges that God grants to all those who choose to receive the kingdom of God. Okay? So we'll start with the first one, and we'll talk about identity here tonight. Identity. This is the single most life-transforming privilege that any human being on earth can ever receive from God. Whether you agree with me or not, our identity plays a huge role in our life. The identity of who we are, 
whose we are, has a bearing to the opportunities, favor, openings, success of our life. And as people, we place great value on our sense of identity because it gives us self-worth, confidence. It defines us as to who we are by what we do. Our Heavenly Father understands the inner need of mankind for identity. 2020 this year, earlier, um, in the United States, they found a um, man who was left for dead behind a garbage bin, bloody and beaten. So in the morning, as people found him, they immediately you know, rushed him to the hospital, and upon getting to the hospital, they tried to figure out who this person was to get him admitted into the hospital. He had no form of identification on himself. There was no wallet, nothing that could help people to know who he was. So as they admitted him in the hospital, the hospital didn't know what to name him, so they basically named him Patient X. Even after they admitted him in the hospital, they still tried to find the identity of this man, and they could not find the identity of him. The newspaper got wind of this man. They wanted to help, so they published a story about this man who was found half dead behind a garbage dumpster and asking for anyone to come forward who can recognize who this man was. And after some days of treatment, the man finally comes back to his conscience, and he also is unable to remember who he is. He doesn't know his name. He doesn't know where he's from. He has an amnesia where he is not able to recollect until now. He is a man with no identity, still known as patient X. Today, in the church, we have so many Christians who have gospel amnesia. They wake up every day having forgotten who they are, who they belong to. We work tirelessly to construct our own identity through our accomplishments and our endeavors. We believe in Jesus, but we've forgotten about the new identity that we got from him at the cross when we met him. We're living in times when there is a huge majority of people who feel lost and are on a constant pursuit of discovering who they are and what adds value to their life. Just get on social media. And you will find millions of young people who are so confused about life, who are so lost about who they are. And there's so many things that they're doing in their life that they're trying somehow to define who they are. They're trying somehow to discover their identity, their sense of worth and value. People today, I think, feel an increased pressure to build their own identity. And yet when you look at human history... Your identity was something that was given to you. You didn't decide where you were born or where you would grow up or what nationality you would be as a child. Today, there are so many options that are almost unlimited, you know, the freedom to construct our own identity. And along with it comes this pressure to earn the world's approval, to want to be received and approved by the people among whom we live. What career will I choose? And how will me choosing that career reflect who I am as a person? How will I be defined among my community with what kind of job I have? And so many young people within the church derive such a great sense of identity from their job, from their education, from, from their different things in their family. They've forgotten who they are and who they belong to. What do you find your identity in, those of you who are listening to me tonight? Is it your past failures that define who you are as a person? Or the hope of your future success that you hope to one day achieve? Do you find your identity in your work or in your accomplishment? Is your identity found in your personality or something you're really good at? The search for identity is real. But most of the things that we choose to build our identity upon are fleeting. If you build your identity on your reputation, that can be undone with a single tweet or a Facebook post these days. 
If you base your identity on your money, an economic downturn, or something called COVID-19 can instantly turn your savings and fortunes into nothing. If your identity is dependent on your career, one bad career decision can end your career. The kingdom of God provides us a different way of thinking about our identity. And listen to me carefully. Through the gospel and through the kingdom, our identity is received, not earned. I'll say it again. Through the gospel, our identity is received, not achieved. We're drawn into the kingdom by the incredible love of a heavenly father. And not just brought into the kingdom, but then God declares us to be sons and daughters of the king and sends us out as ambassadors who will then represent him personally to the world. God gives us an identity that's unshakable. It doesn't depend upon our circumstances. It doesn't change with trends. It doesn't come and go with seasons. The identity he bestows upon us is stable and strong and unchanging just like him. But at the core of this identity that God bestows upon his children, the truth is we are sons and daughters of a king. We are sons and daughters of a loving heavenly father. Can I remind you that this evening, friends? Can I remind you, you are absolutely adored, beloved. You are the apple of his eye. You don't have to look to people to deserve that, that love that you're so yearning for. You don't have to let people define you as to who you are. There was a God in heaven whose love for you was so incredible that he would leave his throne and step down on earth with one purpose to prove to you and me his incredible love and incredible identity that he wanted to place in you and me and say, I'm your dad. You're my son. You're my daughter. And God wants to remind you, you know, don't ever forget this life-changing truth that every Christian has to hold on to, that every follower of Jesus Christ has to remind themselves often, I am a son and a daughter of a living God, and his purpose is my purpose. His plan is my plan, and God has put me here on earth to accomplish and achieve certain things for his kingdom. So not just identity, but here's the incredible thing. I would call it the second privilege of being part of the kingdom, and it's the adoption into God's family. Adoption. Nothing shapes your identity more than your family. As much as we tend to think that we are in control of our lives, nobody chooses where they are born and to whom they are born to. Yes? There's no questionnaire handed out in heaven asking you to fill out your preference for daddy and mommy or your siblings. You know, if you only had that chance, you could, you could do something about that. No, you're not. Your DNA is already predetermined. Did you know that? You don't get to choose what your DNA would be. Your parents are decided for you. And this shapes your physical appearance, for which some of us are happy about, and for some of us we're not. It shapes your personality. You know, and those endless quirks that make you inescapably you, that's from your family. Thank them or no, don't thank them. Even if you're not fond of your family, or if you distance yourself from your family, their influence on your life remains. Whether you like them or, or don't like them, whether you love them or rebel against them, they have still had an impact upon your identity. Now take that and bring it into what God is then calling as being adopted into his family. To be brought into his family is to take those amazing things that we're talking about where there is an impact there is an impression upon who we are, the way we talk, the way we behave, the way we look. Everything then begins to reflect us 
on who we belong to, which is the kingdom of God, the family of God. Through the cross, God reconciled us to himself and bought us with his precious blood to become part of his family. If you thought a biological family has great impact, you just wait till you read about the spiritual family and what the spiritual family can do for you as well. Because the spiritual family doesn't end here on earth. It carries on for eternity. And that's was what God's desire has always been, to establish an eternal family for himself. And this is what God says to every single one of us. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. God says, I will be your father. You will be my sons and daughters. You know, if there's one verse that needs to be underlined in your Bible, that, that could be it. You know, anytime you feel alone, anytime you feel like there's no one there fighting for your cause, anytime you feel like no one understands what you're going through, that's the scripture to be an anchor of hope for you. To come to this heavenly father who says, I'll be your dad, you'll be my sons, you'll be my daughters. The grace by which we are adopted into God's family gives us access to God. The same God who created humanity in his image then puts his stamp on us and asks us to be his image bearers, meaning we become the representatives of the family of God here on earth. You know, the parable of the prodigal son, I think, is a great um, way to describe what happened with man. You know, when you read Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, the Bible talks about God creating man in his image and in his likeness. That's how God created us, in his image and his likeness. You know, like I said, in family, we carry the likeness and the image of our people that we're related to. And that's how God started everything. He created us to be like him. But somewhere we lost our way. Our identity was stolen. In that garden, there was a thief who came and deceived us and stole our identity. It happens today, you know, for many people. Identity theft is, is no laughing matter. You know, people have lost millions of, 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 of their dollars or rupees because someone decided to steal the identity. I tell you, we've lost our identity. We were like that prodigal son that Jesus talked about. who we were destined for great things, but then we found ourselves sitting with the pigs. But I love a part of that parable where the truth of the way God relates with us is then revealed to us. You know, the parable that Jesus shared, the turning point of that story was when the young man came to a realization that there has to be more to life than this. He sat there among with the pigs, and he thought to himself, there has to be more to life than this. I'm meant for better things. I'm meant for greater things. And here I am, totally squandering my life. And I tell you, those are the moments that change and transform the lives of so many people. When they have gone through everything in life, when they've enjoyed all that is to be enjoyed, when they have achieved all that is to be achieved, and when they've accomplished all that is to be accomplished, and they come to the end of everything and they realize there's more to this than what I've gone through. And that's why the Bible talks about repentance. The moment the son said, I am going to go to the father, I'm going to ask for his forgiveness. I'm going to ask to be a servant in his house because I can't bear to look at his face. The remorse was so great and genuine within him that he realized I don't have any qualification within me to ever be called his son again. And it was in that moment when he decided to take those steps towards home, the father who was standing afar drops everything and runs towards him. And this is the exact picture of how God adopts people into his family. We who are lost, we who have, you know, totally abandoned God. But the moment we come to that realization where we realize there's more to life than what I've gone through. I feel empty after all my accomplishments. I feel so frustrated with my life. I want something more. And we begin to search for greater meaning 
Those are the moments God brings us into his family, into the kingdom of God. Adopts us. You know, I love this scripture in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 onwards. It says, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So when the time fully came, God sent his son for one purpose, to redeem us from the law so that he can start the adoption process. And not only is God our king, through the process of adoption, he becomes our father. He becomes a sweet, loving, heavenly father. And a lot of people sometimes, whenever we refer to God as father, you know, people who have not had a, a good experience with an earthly father who probably had an abusive dad or probably had an absentee father, you know, then immediately have negative things that they begin to think about a father. But I want to clarify and I want to tell you the heavenly father is the most perfect, perfect example of what a father should be and can be. He is the father to the fatherless. He is a father who loves unconditionally. He's a father who's always waiting by our side. He's a father who delights in bestowing into our lives good, good things. He cherishes us intimately and great. Our relationship with our father, there's two aspects to it that makes a relationship with a father great. And I will call it as intimacy and reverence. When you have a relationship without intimacy and only reverence, then there's cold submission. You only submit, not because you love, but because you fear. But when there is this intimacy with God and reverence for him, you begin to have the perfect balance of a healthy relationship. Just like me with my father, I love my father, but at the same time, I respect him greatly. And I cannot have it one way or the other. And when you have both of it together, you begin to experience what God intended for an incredible relationship that he desired to have with us. Adoption not only changes our view of God, it also shapes the way we view ourselves. We become beloved children, adopted into a royal family, and given all the rights and privileges of a son. And to be clear, being adopted into the family of God does not mean we become the second tier children to God. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. 17, the Bible says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. <laughs> I love what the Bible says. If you're children, then what are we? Come on, say it loud. Heirs. Heirs of what? Heirs of God. <laughs> and not just heirs, joint heirs with Christ. <laughs> If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So the Bible is saying, in Christ you've been adopted. And when you're adopted and you're called children, you're not just children, but then you become heirs to the kingdom of God. And not just heirs, you become joint heirs with Jesus Christ. For us, a lot of times, in, I don't know whether it's, it's, it's a culture in our country or whether it's a common understanding Whenever we talk about adoption, we feel it's a second-class child. You know, it's a stepchild. And what would a stepchild have that, you know, the real child didn't have? So a lot of negativity is attached to it, and that's why the scripture clearly makes this incredible statement. We are not just children. God proved his love for us by saying, you're not just children, but you've become heirs, joint heirs with my beloved son. All that I'm going to give him is yours. Everything that he has is yours. You have the same access, the same privilege to me, to my throne, as my son Jesus Christ has. I think this is the, one of the most amazing truths in the word of God that should excite every Christian because this is a love that this has not been displayed on this earth like this. 
by anyone else except our Heavenly Father. Even when Jesus, one of the last prayers he prayed on earth, these were his words in John chapter 17, verse 26. Jesus says, the love with which you have loved me, may it be in them. He's saying to the Heavenly Father, the love with which you have loved me, may it be with them. Adoption. Your sons and daughters. Not just sons and daughters, but your heirs. Meaning everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to you. Everything that is belonging to our Heavenly Father is yours. So you have this identity. You have this adoption. And then the third part of being the privilege of the kingdom is access. Access to the king. Access to our Heavenly Father. The more important and powerful someone is, the harder it is to get access to them. You know, the chief minister of Tamil Nadu is a very powerful and important man. But if I tried hard enough, I think I might be able to get some time with him. But if I move up the political ladder and want to meet with the honorable prime minister of India, who is an even more powerful person, I think my chances are very slim. With all the influence that I have, <laughs> just not much. I don't think I can have an audience with him because he's someone who is very important. He's got a lot of important things to do, a lot of important people to meet. And to have an audience with him is not an easy thing. And this is what is the paradox in the kingdom of God. Here you have the earth with people who are so fragile, who live here and die one day, and they're so hard to find and meet. And yet you would have the creator of heaven and earth, the master, the one. I, I cannot do justice with my limited language in English to describe to you in words enough for you to comprehend the greatness of our God, church. I cannot, if I stood here tonight and the rest of my life, and I tried to describe to you his glory, his splendor, his majesty, his grateful, his greatness, I, I will fall short, way short of trying to get you to see his greatness. And yet, in all his splendor, in all his majesty, and this just breaks me sometimes when I'm praying, and I'm like, God, who am I? What, what have I ever done and achieved and accomplished that I would ever have the ability the, the access to, in a moment's notice, to close my eyes or even to say with my words, Abba, Father, and in that moment be transported from this lowly earth that I am into the very presence of a living God who through one word was able to call those things that are not as though they were. Please do not underestimate the greatness of our God. Do not underestimate His supremacy, His holiness, His grandeur, His splendor. Sometimes we've lived long enough on earth that we forget we have a God who is indescribable immeasurable, uncontainable, who is beyond words, and yet the same God, he says to you and me, he says, come, come, call upon me, and I will answer you. I'll be with you in trouble. I will deliver you. I will honor you, and I will be your father. I, it, it, it's hard for me as a person with my limited understanding to grasp of what great splendor and what great majesty that he has, and yet would make me and you to have full access to his very throne room. To his very throne room. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says, Let us then, with confidence, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time. There's not a king in this world who you and I could simply walk up to whenever we felt like it. Only people of power, wealth, and influence are permitted to approach a human ruler or a king. And even if they could approach that said person, they would approach with fear and trembling and would have few moments, fleeting moments in their presence. And most of the time, they would never achieve what they had hoped to achieve in their presence. Then you bring the kingdom of God 
and the way God set it up to give limitless, endless access to every single son, every single daughter in a moment's notice to walk into his very throne room and enter into a conversation with him freely, with no end in sight, with full confidence, Hebrews 4.14 says. By grace, we are sons and daughters. By grace. Not by what we have done, my friend. Not by what we have achieved. Not by our spirituality. Not because of our background. It is purely and only by the grace of God that you and I have the ability to receive the kingdom of God. You know, unlike the identities that we try to build for ourselves, the identity that God gives are unshakable. But to truly embrace and live in this identity, we must understand where it comes from. It doesn't come from who we are and what we've done, what we've accomplished. It comes from who he is and what he did for us that puts us in the position to be called sons and daughters. I pray that I have painted a convincing enough picture for you and me to understand the glorious riches of being called a son and a daughter of the king. The world that we live in is so fleeting. It'll be quickly gone. All the things that you perspire for, aspire for, all the things that you want to do and want to achieve, it's going to go by so quickly. And your life here on earth is going to be a shadow of what it is going to be when we get to the other side in eternity. As a child of God, do we take it seriously, the purpose and the mission for the kingdom of God? That's why Jesus said in the prayer in Matthew chapter 6, when he taught the disciples how to pray from 19 onwards, he says, this is how you pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This should be our prayer every single day, church. This should be our obsession. This should be the thing that should be waking us up in the night. This should be what we dream for, aspire for, the day when the kingdom of God and his righteousness comes down on earth. Maybe you've allowed yourself to get distracted with the pursuit of temporary things here on earth. Maybe you've allowed yourself to derive a sense of worth from things, from people, from achievements. I'm calling you to come back to the heart of the kingdom of God, where the identity of the kingdom of God is not given to us based on what we have done. It is given to every one of us based on what Jesus Christ did on that cross. You can freely receive, fully receive the sonship, the daughtership, being called <laughs> child of God. The very same power, authority, access that was given to Jesus has now been made available to every single human being through Jesus Christ, to receive and to experience. Tonight, I pray that there will be a recalibration of your thinking, of your views, of the way you, you make decisions in your life, that you would come back and have, you know, that spiritual amnesia taken care of where you remember who you belong to. And you remember for why you were put on earth for not for ourselves, but for him, for his purpose. I pray that that passion overtakes hearts tonight, that it would burn in us this, this desire that says, I want to do something for God while I'm here. I want to I give up of my life, my desires, my dreams to become his, for his kingdom. Would you lift your hands with me all over this place? Holy Spirit, I know you are here in a strong way. I know you're speaking to many people here. I know you're, you're speaking to hearts. You're turning them towards the Heavenly Father. There is a heavy conviction that is being placed upon people who are listening right now to turn back to you, 
to be like that prodigal son who comes to that realization, says there's more to life than what I am seeing and experiencing. There's more to life than what I am doing right now. And I pray that heaviness of that realization will fall upon people who find themselves in meaningless pursuits of endeavors in their life where it's going to end in more frustration that tonight, Holy Spirit, that you will heavily put upon them that desire for more, the desire to say, I want more out of life. I want to have meaning. I want to have purpose. And not just stop there, but Holy Spirit, I pray, the Holy Spirit will bring them to Jesus Christ tonight. The power of the cross will be made available to every single person, both here who are, who are standing with me and those who are watching, will have a new revelation and a new understanding of the power and the significance that comes with being part of the kingdom of God. I pray that we will open our hearts and we will invite you into our lives. We will invite the kingdom of God into our lives. And in doing so, I pray that you will change identities. That, Lord, feeling of uselessness or feeling of I, I am failure, I pray that tonight it will be broken over lives will be broken over the lives of people. The lie that the enemy speaks into our ears by stealing our identity that was given to us by the cross through the precious blood of Jesus Christ tonight, we take it back. We take it back. We are sons. We're daughters of a living God. We have been made with a purpose. There is a God who wants to do great things in our life and through our lives. And tonight I pray there will be a great revelation of the purpose and the plan of God for your children tonight, Lord. A fresh identity that only you can give to be received into your, into your family. For anyone who is listening to this message who cries out to Jesus and repents of their sin, I thank you that they are brought into the family of God and adopted into his family. I pray that you will encourage and strengthen everyone who's here tonight and those who are listening that your joy and your favor will be their portion. As they go back into their daily living, I pray that you will give significance to everything they do and let it have impact, the things that they do for the kingdom of God. And like it was said, that you are with Joseph. Lord, I pray that you will be with us in all that we do and bless the work of our hands. And I pray for health and strength for anyone who is in our congregation who is sick, who is in need of a touch, that tonight we ask for the healing virtue of Jesus Christ to go alongside their bed and touch them and heal them and strengthen them. We pray for the mighty, precious hope and the blood of Jesus Christ over their life. Even for that person who is watching online who has a, a daughter called Zara, I pray that tonight the healing power of Jesus Christ will touch Zara and will give her health and strength. In the name of Jesus, be healed. We declare the healing virtue of Jesus Christ to go forth into their life right now, we pray, Father. Thank you for good things that you're doing in our life. We give you the glory, honor, and praise. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a good hand of praise for he is good. Hallelujah.